that we do delight in introducing each other when we're preaching, but I think it's so great because it's just like we love working together, and it's such a gift to have someone to partner with that you love and respect, and she's been such an amazing part of my experience here at The Way. So we are in this Advent season. Advent is the season that we spend preparing for Christmas so that its spiritual significance isn't lost on us. Advent is, means coming, and our theme this month is awaken. And what I want to talk about today is what are we waking up to? All right, so if we're talking about awaken, what are we waking up to? I was thinking about this a little bit because I'm a, Pastor Tisha talked last week about heavy sleepers. And I was one of those, like, all my life I was the snooze button kid. You know, I don't know if any child, like, just pops out of bed. But, you know, my whole life I was snooze button. Except for there, and then I can look back on a few moments in my life when, there didn't need to be an alarm and my eyes just opened and I was like, yes. You know, I feel like my wedding day was one of those days I wasn't like, mm, mm, you know, I was like, I don't need an alarm for today. And so when you, it depends on what you are waking up to, right? That forms your attitude about getting up. Like if we're waking up to a nightmare, everyone's just be like, mm, go back to sleep. And so that's what I want to talk about today. And our scripture today is Isaiah 11. And Isaiah 11 is poetry. All right, so exegeting or preaching off of poetry requires like a little bit of creativity because it's not like two plus two is four. Do you agree? Four? And we can all be like four. Because poetry is about images. Poetry is about stirring your imagination. It's about using images and analogies to get something in your soul to connect. You know, I think about how when the Hebrews were enslaved, there was always talk about the promised land and how it was a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, we all know literally it was not like rivers of dairy. I would live for some rivers of dairy, cheese, rivers of cheese, but milk and honey. But it's meant to stir in your mind that this is a luxurious, abundant place, right? Have you ever thought about like why God gave you an imagination, like what it is for? And I think part of our imagination's function is to imagine things in the spiritual realm that aren't in existence yet but our coming and our imagination helps us hold on to that. And so poetry stirs some of that. Um, the promised land, Jesus is always talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. It's like this, it's like that, because you can't quite see it. It's not fully here. So you need something that gets your imagination to stir up. Um, I think also one of my favorite, you know, uh, you know favorite sermons, speeches that's ever happened was Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Um, not that it hasn't been absolutely distorted and weaponized or problematic whiteness, but in its true revolutionary nature, um, <laughs> right, I'd be like, oh, little second grader, do you know how they're making you misuse this little speech right now? But in its true thing that, in, the, in its original purpose, that when he said, I have a dream, this was meant to stir something in people's souls and imaginations that actually makes you wake up to how I am not satisfied with this present reality, right? He's like, I have a dream that this is what's going to be able to happen with my children, this child and this child playing together. And so the dream, waking up to a dream doesn't actually make you less engaged with the present. It actually creates a sort of resistance to the present and a prophetic resistance to the present. And so when we're talking about what are we waking up to, in some ways, we are waking up to a dream. We are waking up to an aspirational vision of what could be. So I'm going to read Isaiah 11 for us. Um, and remember, it's images. And so even if literally you don't know what every image means, kind of see what it stirs in you as you listen to it. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. Now, just pay attention how vivid this imagery is. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant 
will play near the cobra's den. The young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen? Amen. So that is what we are going to explore a little bit today. All right, the first part of this, Isaiah 11, is it says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Now, I just feel like that's one of those Bible phrases. If you've been around church, you've like heard it a lot, like, mm, the stump of Jesse. But none of us really knows what it means. Nobody is like, mm, you really got that stump of Jesse vibe going on. You know, you're like, mm, you got that real stump of Jesse spirituality. It's like one of those things that we all kind of like nod. You sing it when it comes up in the random Christmas hymn, and then you're like, and on we go. But I really want to talk about this image for a minute because I think it's pretty cool. So Jesse is King David's father. And back in the day, when Israel looks at its history, it would say that it, would, it was at its peak. It was at its best. It was thriving economically, militarily, culturally, architecturally. Just every way that they want to be thriving as a nation, as a people, would be under King David and his son Solomon's leadership. And so the way they would think about themselves at that time is that they are like a huge, thriving, healthy, glorious tree. I got us a little image to help us think about like how beautiful a healthy tree is. Um, one of the things I love about the Bay Area is if you've ever been to like the Redwood Forest, you can get there in like 15 minutes from Oakland. It's kind of magical that it's so close. And you have you, when you go into the Redwoods, when you go into the forest, you know how there's like a unique kind of silence? It's like the air, like sound gets absorbed in a different way. And so it just kind of transports you a little bit. And when Israel thinks of its history, it's like, that's when we were glorious. These trees, this tree that took up space like this. But because of unfaithfulness and disobedience to God's commands, the consequences of that were being occupied and being put into exile. So after their experience with Babylon and after their experience with Assyria, and now they're currently, in Jesus' time, occupied by Rome, they don't feel like a tree. They feel like a stump, right, that it's been cut down and they've become this. And that's a pretty tragic present reality when you think about oh, our history was this glorious, healthy, thriving tree, and all that's been cut down, and now we're just this dead stump that just reminds you of what used to be here. And then it says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. So the image is now from this dead thing that's rotting away, Let's go, there's one before this one. Can we see the little one with the little glass? There we go. That something sprouts out. And so when it says a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, it's referencing this whole arc of Israel's history of like, you, there was greatness and then there was great devastation. But what if out of the source of that, there's a little bit of life coming? And this image, it reminded me um, of when I was in a class with a teacher of mine uh, Julian Palmert, and she would ta talked about the idea of a nurse tree. So Julian is this amazing Blackfoot woman. I really liked her because she was like in her late 60s. She had her PhD, but she's like, I'm going to get a second PhD because nobody can mess with a Native American grandma with two PhDs, and I'm going to say what I want to say. And I was always like, okay, Julian. Like, I've never heard of like a vengeance PhD, but like that's what she was doing, and she's like, now I'm going to do it for my people. And I just love, she was about her people, you know, and like reclaiming and bringing healing to indigenous folks on this land. And she taught me, and so now we can go to the next image, this idea of a nurse log. And so she said, in the woods, what'll happen is sometimes a tree will fall over, but then the new trees will literally grow on it. And as it sort of decays, it nourishes and brings this new tree into existence. And I think this image really speaks, it connects to me about like the shoot of life coming out of something dead. And I think that we can, we can feel that when we look at history, when we look at maybe some of our own family history, when we look at this country and we look at some of the problematic systems, we can look and just be like, I see death everywhere. But what I love about this image is what that's, we don't deny that that's true, but what if that can be redeemed because then it becomes the source of bringing life. And what this, what this image is giving us in Isaiah is this stump that you thought was cut down and there's only death to look at, I'm now bringing and breathing new life into and through that. Amen? So that's how this opens. 
That's how this opens. And then we get this image of, all right, what is this new sprout going to look like? What is the nurse log bringing to light? And I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to move through this quickly. We're going to do the back half and then come back to this image. But it talks about, it says, he won't judge you by what he sees with his eyes or decide what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor. And I will just say, I don't know if you've ever had to go to court um, but what you want the feeling to walk into is that you are walking into a good judge. Like, you don't want that feeling that, like, oh, this judge in a bad mood today, or this judge has a reputation for being terrible and harsh. But what if n not only did you walk in and you were like, okay, this judge seems okay, but you, ha you were in front of a judge that radiated compassion and understanding for your situation in particular. I always think about like, um, particular for moms, especially when you have like moms with young kids or like if you ever, like your moms with young kids and their kid is like losing it in the grocery store. And um, I lived with my godchildren. I remember when they were going through the terrible twos, it was literally like, I was like, are you possessed by a demon right now? Like, I don't know what's going on because you so cute, but you waited till we got in public and then like a fierce strength came over you and you decided that this public place is where you had to be like crazy. And it's easy to feel like everyone around you is judging you. You know, all that love and you, you home playing the games and like putting them to bed. Nobody sees that. All they see is like your hair coming apart, your outfit looking crazy and like you just trying to hold it together with this child. And you feel, but what if, um, the people, if you looked up and you didn't see critical judgment, but you saw a group of other moms who all looked at you with compassion and kindness and understanding. And what this image is, is coming before a judge who doesn't accuse you and see you with eyes like how like the world sees you, but someone who looks at you with full understanding of your situation. And so I love that image. The sprout is going to judge in a way that feels life-giving. And then there's this intense image of he'll strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. I mean, it just means like the words that come out of his mouth literally be like hitting the earth with a stick. Like that's how powerful and authoritative this, this sprout will be. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness and faithfulness are going to be the clothing he wears. So, but I'm going to come back to that because I want to sit on this image here of the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and the little child will lead them. Okay. We are not very much like a hunting people. I mean, maybe some of y'all like secret life, but not, uh, not many of us, I don't feel like you guys are like, yes, I'm out here protecting my sheep from wolves. That's not our day-to-day -day reality. So I want to share with you a little bit how I learned a bit more about this. Um, so about a couple years ago, actually more than a couple years, let's see, I got married in 2007, so I was still dating, so like 2006-ish, I went to Tanzania, East Africa for three months, and I lived with this Dutch missionary, uh, East, uh, Tanzania is just south of Kenya, and um, I wanted to learn more about the AIDS crisis, because you saw it a lot in the news, but I kind of wanted to see for myself what was going on, so I just, volu not even volunteered, that makes it sound like I was useful, I was just there to learn and to see from like local folks who were doing the real work. I can't pretend that like I came in all not speaking Swahili and was useful. But um, I, I did, I learned a lot and the hospitality folks was fantastic. And um, I learned a lot more about the complexity of how to care and address the issue and understand that Western media was just going off in its own world. That's its own story though. At the end of the time though, um, in Tanzania is the Serengeti, one of the most like amazing people, places that you can like you know, do a safari. And because it was off season for like a couple hundred dollars, I was able to go on this multi-day safari. It was amazing. And so when we got out there and we're like driving into like the, uh, the safari, I was mad because the, every time I saw an animal, my first frame of reference was a Disney movie and particularly the Lion King. And I was mad. I was like, I am at the real thing. I am sitting, and all I can think is like, oh my gosh, it's, uh, oh, that's the, uh, it's this character. I would like sing the songs and I just felt like this cartoon was ruining my life. Like Disney takes, makes you think of the fake thing instead of the real thing. I was mad. But about after a day later, I started to get past, you know, like, oh, that's like the priest and Lion King. So one of the things I noticed was every animal, uh, everywhere you go is always on alert. Like, it just, it, it's always ready to run. Like, nobody's chilling, no animal is journaling. Like, always, if a few of them are, like, laying down, like, a few of them are always on alert. And it doesn't take much for them to start running. Do you know what I mean? They're not like, do you guys think we should start running now? Like, I don't know, it seems like a situation. Like, if one of them, like, gets startled, they all go. And then when they're, like, drinking water, you know, 
they always have this, they're like drinking eyes up all the time. And zebras have this thing where even when they want to rest, they stand next to each other and they rest their heads on each other's backs so they can look like full 360 view while resting a little bit. So it's interesting, you're like, man, everybody, everything is on alert because it could get attacked by a predator at any point. And there's just no, no, no place to go. And so then the only animal that was a contrast to that was lions. Lions literally were napping everywhere. Like middle of the street, middle of a valley, an open space, a space under a tree. And not like in a sort of like, I mean just sprawled out like, all of them, like 10 of them, knocked out. They weren't like, let's keep one of us awake to stay alert to what's going on. They were out. And what became clear is because they are the most powerful predator, they're not afraid of anything attacking them. Everything is on alert for them and other predators. And so I began to have more respect. And so I wanted to show us a couple of pictures. I was like, am I gonna show videos of lions hunting? And I was like, no, I'm seriously gonna traumatize the saints of the way, so I didn't, I'm not showing us videos of animals hunting. But I did want us to get us out of Disney cartoon. Because when we talk about this, the, the wolf uh, will live with the lamb and the leopard will lie down and the lion will lay down with this little yearling, I want us to get Disney characters out of our mind and remember these are hostile predatory relationships. So we'll just look at a few. So this is like a leopard. It looks like a cartoon because it's low res, but it's actually a real picture of a leopard getting attacking a hawk. That is a tense relationship. That's a lion. You know the ladies be doing all the hunting in the pride. These two do not look like after this they will get coffee. And then this, this will, the next photo that you saw, that's a wolf dog. I just want to remind you like how big a wolf is. That's not even a full wolf. 9 a.m. said, please don't show that slide for very long. <laughs> but just for, uh, just for per a sense of like how big these animals are, and this is a friendly relationship, but these animals out in the wild are predatory, and they're hunters, but that is the, their relationship with these other animals. All right, let's go on, because I promised 9 a.m. that I wouldn't make them look at that image for too long. <laughs> and so... What we're talking about here, when it starts to talk about the lion will lay with the lamb, is we're not talking, we have to think about a whole system that makes that possible. We're not talking about an exceptional system where there's one friendly lion who becomes friends with a lamb. That's like a Disney movie, like, I am a lion and I'm friends with a lamb and we're buddies, it's unusual. Like, that's not the story that Isaiah 11 is talking about. Like, we're talking about, because that's very Disney, do you know what I mean? Like, look at this lion that was different than the other lions and like, they became buddies. Or like, the internet loves to have like, unusual animal couples. None of that is happening here. What this is telling us is the entire system has changed such that these animals, which typically have had a very violent relationship with one another, that whole relational system has changed so that now there is like peace between them. And so as I was thinking about how we could dig into this image, um, I remembered the, that the most kind of impactful sermon that I've ever heard on this was given a few years ago in Ferguson um, by a gentleman named John Dorhauer. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, what he spoke on. So I was in um, Ferguson one year after Michael Brown Jr. had been murdered. There was a lot of things going on. To, there was different gatherings and conferences and um, actions and protests happening. And so I had attended um, a conference for, it was called Concerned Black Scholars, which was talking about black academics in conversation with activists to see what's the intersection of black academics and ac uh, activists on the ground. And that's the first time I got to see Pastor Tracy Blackman speak, and she was just amazing, right? She's like this anointed leader who's like on the ground in Ferguson, who's been pastoring all these movement leaders. And um, I had a chance to go to her church that Sunday. So I was like, I'm gonna go Pastor Tracy Blackman's church. I'm gonna hear just like one of the wokest pastors there is. I'm gonna just I'm gonna receive from God because during that season I had like was going to church only very sporadically because it was so traumatizing to go to church sometimes when they wouldn't address what was happening out in the world. And so I was like, y'all are making it hard to follow Jesus. So I was like, that's not gonna happen here. And I walked in and I remember being like. Oh my God, this is amazing. Like I was living in Portland at that time, like churches were silent, silent. And I walked in and the entire choir had on, a sh had on shirts that said, black lives matter, black love matters, black votes matter, black church matter. 
And I was like, yes, okay, I am at church. Here we go, Pastor Tracy Blackman's church is going to be on. I'm going to get a word. And then she comes up and she's like, I will not be speaking today. My friend, Dr. John Dorhauer, will be speaking. And up comes this like middle-aged white dude. And I was like, <laughs> I tur- literally, my friend and I turned to each other. And we was like, I know we didn't come to Ferguson, Missouri to be hearing whoever this man is. You know, right? Like we were trying, we were like, So he got up there and he was like, I'm going to preach on Isaiah 11. And he had actually done his PhD dissertation on that scripture from the perspective of white privilege and white supremacy. And what would it take for the lamb to want to lay down with the lion? And so we were like, hmm, okay, 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 cool, 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 let's see. And by the middle of the sermon, we were like, In- interesting, sir, very, cha-, you know, and we were like, I've never heard a white person say this. And then by the end, we were like, I have literally never heard anyone say this. And by the end of the sermon, we were like, Brother John is preaching a word. <laughs> and, you know, we were like, <laughs> he really won us over. And so I'm going to share some of the points that Brother John made in his sermon. So the first thing he said about the lion and the lamb laying down, he said, there's only one pathway that is laid out in Isaiah 11. And it is a path that must be chosen by the lamb. It cannot be a path that's chosen by the lion. If the lion comes in and the lion's like, we're gonna lay down together, cuddle with me. You know, like the system of power and exploitation and imbalance hasn't been resolved, right? So the way that that relationship comes into being has to come through a, a, a pathway that is laid out by the lamb. And so, we're, and, and like I said, in, in this context, he was talking about um, particularly black folks interacting with white folks around white supremacy and white privilege. The second thing he said is the lion's only task is to ask the lamb what it wants, what it requires, so that it will willingly choose to lay down with the lion. He said white privilege must be laid down at the feet of the lamb. And then the, one of the last things he said was that the lion must give up its memory and its nostalgia for its own power. So I just want to talk about each of those things for a little bit. So one is, like I said, this isn't about just one individual. And it, this system of lion and lamb, it can be around race. It can also be around gender and patriarchy. Right, it can be around class and the way that the rich, it's all these systems of violence, the way the rich have been violent to the poor, uh, the way white folks have been violent towards black people or indigenous people, the way patriarchy has created violence between men and women. Um, you know, I think there can be the history of violence between straight folks and queer folks. So uh, this, this principle can be applied to any system where we see that violence has happened in the context of Im- uh, imbalanced power. And so what has to happen for the lion is their entire relationship, like lions are hunters. So for a lion to lay down with the lamb is, is not just a pause in its behavior, it's a fundamental change in identity, right? It doesn't mean, the lion can't just be like, cool, I'll pause to snuggle with you. I'll be back out hunting your friends later. Right, for this, because it's about systemic change, right? Like I said, when I'm talking about, when, we, when uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream, he wasn't like, yeah, if my children play with some white children, but nothing out here is resolved, my dream has come true. What he meant was, I want the whole system to be erased, transformed, and redone so that this snapshot is an example of all the shalom and peace that has come into existence. Does that make sense? And so the lion laying down with the lamb is, what would it take for a lion to be like, I'm not a hunter anymore? Right in here, it literally, if Lauren was joking around in between, she was like, the lion becomes vegan and starts eating hay. <laughs> but it's like, the lion literally, it changes, it changes its entire identity and what it eats and how it interacts with the world. What would have to be true for the lamb to say, I'm willing to have this kind of relationship with you. What level of behavior change and for how long would you have to see it? Right, because you're not gonna do it after one day. Like, we good, let's snuggle. Right, you're gonna need to see ongoing, consistent change for a long period of time. And then the second thing that he says is, um, you, you can't even just have a memory for how it used to be. Right, to me, it's like even sometimes when people are, um, you see this all the time with the nostalgia around the Confederate flag, you know, like the antebellum period. 
And like people are like, why is that problematic? It's like because you daydreaming about how wonderful it was back in the day when you could exploit me is not a great situation. <laughs> like as long as that's your romantic dream, I don't feel like building shalom cuddles and community with you. And so it's not just stop doing the thing now, but it's even in your own mind, stop daydreaming about how it used to be. And he talks about, um, Brother John talked about how basically really even having to give up the memory of it. And I think we see this in different places. Like even when we're talking about patriarchy and we're talking about the shift in gender roles, sometimes you'll see like, ah, oh, I just... I kind of miss the good old days when like the ladies stayed at home and like men could be out here being, this is my gesture for like traditional masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a better gesture, but you know what I'm saying. Um, you know, I think there can be a nostalgia for like when we're talking about LGBTQ conversations and be like, oh, I remember when it wasn't so complicated and like pronouns and like, I don't even know what some of these terms mean, right? There can be this like nostalgia for like, when you were the privileged person, how you kind of were like, oh, I miss those days. You can see how problematic it is when you are the, uh, like you're the marginalized person, but then when we're the privileged person, we actually have to, we see that nostalgia in ourselves. And so what is happening, what he says, it's, it's not just about changing your present behavior, but not longing for a way it was before, and even letting fully go of the memory of that. And so that is the world that is getting ushered in. I, I started with what, um, the opening question is, what are we waking up to? And Isaiah is giving, this, giving us this picture of a world that the baby that we're anticipating, the baby whose birth we're anticipating, what is the world this baby's gonna bring? The world that this baby is gonna bring is gonna be this, this new tree growing out of this old log. The world that this baby is gonna bring is gonna be one that takes relationships and institutions and systems that have fundamentally been w violent towards people and created these violent relationships and is utterly going to change them to the point where the lion's identity isn't predator anymore. It's totally shifted. That's what we are anticipating and waiting for. In uh, one of my uh, other professors, Randy Woodley, he wrote a book called Shalom and the Community of Creation. And um, shalom is a word meaning peace, but it, it means it's a really complex and robust word, right? It's more than just like not fighting, but it's kind of what every, it's the lion lays down with the lamb kind of rightness. And he says in his book, nothing could be more frightening or more real to people living in a pastoral economy than exposing the things they value most to the things they fear the most. In such an economy, the point of wealth is the ability to secure livestock and land for one's progeny, for your children. Isaiah's point is well taken. Shalom existence is based on newfound security. In shalom, warring over turf and wealth or national security are extinct practices. And so he's talking about, I, you know, I read at the end that the, the author is trying, like, keeps amping it up. Like, hey, there's going to be a tree with a new little shoot. Oh, this lion's going to lay down with the lamb. Be like, oh, you don't understand how different, how, how, how you are going to be free from fear? You're going to take your babies and put them in snake pits and feel great about it. That literally, like, the poet is like, I'm going to have to get crazy to help these people understand. Like, we're putting babies with snakes. That's how different it is. Like, I want you to think about that for a minute. Like, when, I mean, I'm not a parent, so maybe putting your baby with a snake is like a thing that parents are into. But from my observation, parents do everything they can to protect their children from harm, right? And you wouldn't be like, wow, that's like one of the world's most deadliest snakes, and that's like a whole pit full of them. I'm going to put my baby in there and see how that works out. What would have to, okay, one, you're a terrible parent if you do that in the current reality. But imagine a reality where the thing that you most associate with being able to bring death and harm is now something you would place your most valuable and vulnerable um, life relationship into connection with the pit of snakes. And the snakes would be all like, yeah, baby, let me take 
take care of you. And they'd be like, rub the baby's little head till he falls asleep in the snake pit of naps, right? You can't even imagine that because that's too weird. But that's what the poet's trying to stir up is there's this world coming. All we know is violent, fearful relationships. And I'm trying to put the most extreme examples of you don't put babies with snakes, you don't put lambs and lions, but all this in this new world, they lay together in real and whole relationship. And that is what we are trying to wake up to during Advent. That's what we are waking up to. That's what we're longing for. So how do we get there? I think what's interesting about how we get there is, is the unexpected route of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is the other, is the other uh, lectionary scripture for this today. And John the Baptist is giving people a wake-up call. And repentance, actually, I think, is how we embrace this invitation to this dream. I'm sorry, I'm like, just, just <laughs> what is this? I feel like I'm hitting you with splashes of my aggressive words. Okay, so, sorry. <laughs> and she's back. So when John the Baptist is preaching, what he offers in his repentance, and when he says repent, re we often think of repentance as just sort of an interpersonal sin, like, oh, I should stop doing this bad thing. You know, okay, I'm not going to swear from Tuesdays to Saturdays, or, you know, I'm going to, um, uh, you know, try to, uh, you know, uh, we usually associate with, like, swearing and sex if you come from like traditional church. But I think that what actually John the Baptist is giving us an invitation to wake up to is saying, I don't accept how the world is. And that the invitation of Advent is to say, I don't accept. I've become numb. I've actually started to think that like, um, you know, certain forms of racism are okay. I don't believe in anti-blackness, but I've sort of grown tolerant of putting like babies in cages if they're from other countries and they're migrants. You know, I think it's, it's we become, we, uh, you know, it's like, okay, I know I'm not supposed to be totally greedy for money, but I have started to grow numb and believe that, like, I will treat people differently based on what their education level is or how they're dressed or how much money they make. You know, subtle shifts of, I'll show this person a little more respect than I'll show, and we grow numb. And the way the world is in these broken systems, we start to accept them. And part of what I think John the Baptist and what repentance, the invitation to repentance is to say, I don't accept it. I will not accept it. I will not accept babies in cages. I will not accept police violence towards black bodies. I will not accept native women and black women disappearing and there's just no accountability for that. I don't accept that. I don't accept that. And it's saying that I refuse, um, I refuse to give up on hope. It's not a kind of hope that comes from not examining the realities of this present darkness, honestly. It's saying, I see it, and I can see the light coming. That I think there is a world that is, it's not here yet. We don't live in a lion lay with the lamb world. But when this baby is born, it is a small shoot. It is a small piece of life coming from this stump that is going to bring a new way of being. And I can see the light coming. And Advent is saying, all the ways I've grown numb and started to think that darkness is okay and these problematic unjust systems are okay, I'm saying, I repent of that. I say no. I say no. I say no. Repentance is refusing to agree with the world's brokenness. Repentance is believing that things can be different. Repentance is lighting a candle in the darkness, even if that candle is just you. Even if the candle is just you in your workplace. I know some of y'all work in tech. Man, tech is notoriously anti-black and notoriously unfriendly to women of color. And you're gonna be in that space, that you can sit in those spaces and start to feel it erode your humanity and your dignity and be like, nothing's gonna change this system. These people got so much money. Nothing's gonna change it. But then you say, I repent. Because I may not see the full light break forth, but I can see the light coming and I light the candle that is me. I light the candle that is me here in an act of resistance. I do not accept this. I don't accept the anti-blackness that's all over academia. I don't accept all this misogyny and all this violence towards women as something's normal. I do not accept all this violence towards our queer and trans family. I just, I don't accept it. I don't accept it as normal. I do not agree and our repentance is resistance. And that is what Advent is about.
That is what Advent is about. And so that is the season that we are leaning into. We don't want to long for the good old days. We literally want to forget about the days when we were more entrenched in these problematic systems. And we want to look. And here's the thing. I don't know if y'all have, um, last night the breakers went out in our house. So one section of our house lost all power. And my husband was already asleep. And where the, um, the thing is, you know, the fixie box, because um, <laughs> I'm also an electrician in my free time. Um, <laughs> where the fixie box is, is in our basement. And the, where there, so there's no light. So it's nighttime, the lights have gone out, and it's like ultra like back basement behind where we like store stuff that we kind of want to forget that we own. So, and I was like, I'm not going in there. And I'm like grown, feminist, liberated, and I went and sat next to my husband in his bed, and I was like, babe, you're gonna have to get up <laughs> because um, I'm not going into the darkness. But in that pitch blackness, the smallest of light, I would have been able to see it anywhere in that space, right? Because actually when the darkness is even heavier, the smallest of light shines even brighter. And so right now, I mean, there's some dark things happening in our country and in this world, but you know what? Then all the more is your resistance in your spirit your refusal and our collective refusal to say this is normal, we refuse to agree, is what Advent is about. When, uh, when the worship team was singing, I can see the light coming. I felt like God put our worship and our sermon together because that, that mantra is what we are singing in this Advent season. It's what we want to align our souls to. Amen? And so I, actually, I just want to ask us to go back into that, if we can sing that. And, and in, a, in a moment, we're going to actually have our kids come in, and they're going to do some music for us. And um, I love it. I, I, I love it. I love seeing the kids. They're in here practicing multiple times a week. And I love um, giving our kids an opportunity to experience things that we ourselves maybe didn't experience. You know, it's like maybe you didn't have a chance to be trained in, like, classical instruments, but that's what we're given the next generation. Maybe you didn't have a chance to have these kind of lessons, these kind of mentors and community, but we can be the nurse log to the next generation. You know, so we can be the nurse log on so many levels to the next generation. And so I want us, as we're in this Advent season, in any ways that you feel like you've grown hopeless, and complacent. Allow these few weeks before Christmas to be a time where you and your spirit say, I repent of that complacency. I refuse to agree. I can see the light coming and I will also be that light wherever I am. Amen. Amen.